Good morning, everyone. It's uh, just a real treat to see you all here, and I want to tell you a little bit about the wonderful panel I have. We're going to talk about innovation and in mental health reporting, and just a little bit about how I got to, to moderate such a special panel. Um, I'm a faculty member at Columbia. I finished the residency there in 2004, and when you look around your fellow residents, you realize these are going to be the leaders of the field. And boy, I didn't think I quite had that in me. And so I wrote a diet book and, uh, <laughs> and was very terrified to publish that, sure that Chairman Lieberman would for sure dismiss me. Instead, Dr. Deb Cabanis and Dr. Lloyd Cetera had started a writing group, which kind of became a support group for me for a little bit. But they did a lot of great work in terms of helping psychiatrists think about how do we write? How do we write about things like our patients? Um, and as, as you'll see in some of the pieces that we'll highlight today, what's one of the things clearly journalists know how to do, and clearly is at the very front of a story, right? What is the narrative here? Uh, mental health is a struggle with that because we're such a, a private and secretive, in some ways, organization that we want to keep your secrets. I don't want anybody to know anything that was said on my couch this morning, because that's very private between me and my patients. And when we do that, how do we get the story and the message out there? So fast forward quite quickly. Um, as I got involved with publishing a book, uh, I then got involved, maybe didn't know this, but the kale phenomenon actually started at Columbia Psychiatry. Um, Dr. <laughs> Jeffrey Lieberman, I, I asked him, what should I do? I think this is a good way to talk about mental health. We talk about nutrition, because people are interested in nutrition. And he said, get traction. He was eating a lacinato kale salad at the time. And I thought, oh, there must be a sign here. <laughs> and so that's actually where the kale phenomenon came from. And suddenly I was in the public talking about mental health. And it was a little bit, um, uh, uh, led to lots of questions of like, what's appropriate? What happens when patients see you on the media, in the media? Um, what happens when people ask you questions online uh, or on a forum? I became a media expert, which in psychiatry means I got a Twitter account like, a little <laughs> bit early. And then some fun things have happened, like getting the APA on Instagram. And so, uh, which at least, you know, how else are you going to learn about mental health if we can't make it visual in some way? So I wanted to bring a really fun panel together, and these are just some wonderful folks who are actual innovators. I'm not sure that I've done much other than help people eat more kale. Um, but I do think there's a lot of innovation happening, and clearly more needs to happen as you think about what have we talked about this morning in some ways. We've talked about how mental health relates to mass sh shootings. I think about where do we see mental health in the media? Mass shootings, celebrity suicide, and maybe if there's some really exciting new thing like to treat treatment-resistant depression. And to me, those don't match the stories that we see on our couches every day and we see with our patients every day, the very human stories are happening as people are struggling with mental health. So let's talk about this wonderful panel. So we've got two top-notch next-generation reporters who are innovating as they're thinking about mental health. Um, uh, Sarah Smith uh, was at the, the, is a Carter Fellow. Uh, all of you know what that is, but an incredibly esteemed position focusing on mental health journalism. And uh, on top of that, as I was speaking with uh, Stephen about her, he remembers first phone call conversations with her when she was a college student at Penn, saying, how do we cover suicides on a college paper? How do you do that? You know, we're struggling here, lots of folks with graduate degrees and professionals, how do we do it? But how do you do that as a college student? And I, I, um, I, I just love her reporting. Um, it, you should definitely check out the story about Tyler Hare if uh, you think that you're within a mile of dozens and dozens of forensic psychiatrists who could help treat this individual. Instead, he's spending three years in jail with no treatment. Um, She's now in Houston, reporting in Texas, and uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, Taylor Eldridge, um, it, it, another reporter. These are disciples of Meg Kissinger, but a hardcore investigative reporter, but uh, looking at the criminal justice system as uh, in mental health, which as many of you know, that is where there is a lot of mental health need and not a lot of mental health <coughs> care. Um, and, and also talking about, uh, I, I love this, um, uh, she has a story around what happens when police de-escalate. What happens when you know someone is trying to die by suicide um, at the hands of police? And, and just um, uh, both of these uh, journalists, to me, illustrate what we don't have in mental health, the skill set we don't have of how to tell such compelling narrative and stories. But they're both very well published. Taylor also will talk about in an, another moment when we get to our first issue of is self-disclosure innovation, hit a home run in one of her first pieces in The New Yorker, what every uh, graduate student dreams of. And in that, she discloses <laughs> about her time on an inpatient psychiatric ward. Uh, it was a piece that instantly, when I read it, took me back to my time as a resident there. And, um, and it's just really a pleasure to have you here. Um, Vania Manapod is, is a fellow <coughs> psychiatrist. She, I believe, is the most famous psychiatrist on Instagram, at least in my opinion, she should be. And uh, what does that make her? 
She's an influencer. She inspires hundreds and thousands of medical students to think about mental health as a profession. And she discloses herself. Like, here's pictures of her with your niece. I've seen Vania's wedding dress. What does that do to her? She's also a clinician. What does that do between her and her patients? That's brand new. And that's always been against the rules. You're not supposed to know about me. Well, then how do you influence social media if people don't know about you? And then Dr. Ali Matu, uh, a, a psychologist here at Columbia in the Q Card Clinic, and uh, as you can see from, from his banner, um, uh, a wonderfully uh, effusive psychologist around uh, and has a, um, a YouTube video, The Psych Show, in which he educates people. And I encourage you to check these videos out, and, and I want to hear uh, from uh, Ali about Dr. Matu, how this affects your, his clinical practice, but also the inspiration between this. So, uh, inspiration for this. So, I want to start with uh, self disclosure, and I'm going to come and sit down. But, um, Taylor, I want, I want to talk with you uh, first, and, and I want to, uh, you, as I said, hit a home run, and you're suddenly launched into the beginning of a career where um, you're both writing about very real mental health issues and also sharing some of your personal experience. And can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, first of all, do you think self disclosure is an innovation in any way? And and how that has been for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it can be a very simple tool for innovation. Um, I feel like historically journalism has been about, uh, you know, this elite group being the uh, neutral arbiters of the truth for the rest of us, um, covering the others. Um, and I think being able to, as a journalist, say, you know, I'm also, I've also been a patient. I've also had these experiences involving, you know, losing people uh, to suicide and, um, you know, my own experiences with inpatient care just bridges that gap between, the, you know, doesn't otherize people anymore. Um, and I think for me, it's also a method of transparency. You know, it's clear why I cover the things that I cover. You know, I care about criminal justice because I've had particular experiences with criminal justice and I care about mental health because I've had my own experiences with mental health care. Um, and I, I just feel like as a writer, um, you know, allowing my readers to know, you know, this is the source of why I care about these issues uh, really lends an authority uh, to my work. And I think in particular, the New Yorker piece was something that I, you know, it was a story that I've been trying to tell for a while. I didn't write it. Um, I didn't start writing it until two years after my friend had died. Um, it was like, it was that difficult for me to, um, to face. And I realized, you know, if I, I'm writing around it, I was writing stories about hospitals and doctors, um, but I didn't, it took me a long time to be able to sit down and say, this thing happened to me. I experienced this thing. Um, and I think, you know, the way that I think about it is if I'm not able to acknowledge my own experiences and write about myself, how can I go and tell other people's stories? You know, I need to be honest about, um, about my experience before I can be honest about other people's. Um, and I think the New Yorker piece, you know, at first it was scary. It was like, this is my first piece as a journalist. I'm young, you know, am I going to put on my resume that I was hospitalized? Like, that seems like, uh, it seemed a little wild to me. Um, but I think it serves as evidence that I am serious about writing about difficult things, that I can write well about difficult things, and I'm not afraid to you know, tell hard stories. So I think self-disclosure as a journalist can be a really powerful tool. Uh, a world where you can disclose you have mental illness to me sounds like a world without stigma, which is I think one of the hopes that we all have comes from uh, our meeting today, at least getting um, uh, moving towards that. I have a patient who's a psychiatrist and she is at a major medical center here and gave uh, my number to the person she interviewed with who's a psychiatrist, I, and I said, what do you want me to do? And she said, I just want you to call her up and, and check in. I asked her to call in and check in with you. So I thought this was maybe strange, maybe medically, legally odd. And I called up the psychiatrist. She said, you know, it's so strange. In 30 years of um, interviewing and hiring psychiatrists, I've never had a single psychiatrist disclose to me that they were in clinical treatment. Mm -hmm. Sort of strange, right? Even in our own field, I don't think we do a good job of that truthful authenticity. When you're speaking of our field, do you want to um, talk a little bit about what it's like to be a, uh, a reasonably new psychiatrist, um, especially uh, as you are in a very, um, you, share, you share a lot, and, and not just um, in that Instagram way, but what I love about your work is that you talk about being um, in therapy, and I love that because you're a physician. And we know there's incredible burnout and a lack of treatment among physicians, particularly in mental health. And so can you tell us a little bit about, um, uh, one, what do you feel is innovative about it? And how did you get started? And how's it affecting you? Right. Well, it's interesting to think of 
self-disclosure as being innovative because as Taylor mentioned, um, self-disclosure seems so simple, right? It's known, it's a known therapeutic modality to alleviate depression um, in addition to like, that's why peer support groups work. But what is innovative and really powerful is when people in these idealized like professions, like me being a psychiatrist and a physician, and now you see more like athletes coming out and being open about being in mental health treatment, that in itself is innovative. Um, but to do that, it takes a lot of, I think internally you have to feel like resilient to be able to um, deal with any potential consequences. So. For me, when I first started opening up, I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist. I've also experienced depression from being extremely burnt out as a physician in my first job out of residency. Um, and what helped me was being in therapy. So when I was in therapy, I thought, gosh, like um, this is helping me so much. Why aren't we talking about it? And obviously there's potential negative consequences that we as physicians might experience from being open. But for me, the power in being open about it and being a psychiatrist and showing also my patients and the general public like look i might treat mental illness um but i also struggle myself so i found that um the potential amazing things that could happen such as breaking stigma was well worth uh, taking that risk so the balance is pretty hard because um, i'm in a unique situation because I can have these boundaries and also know how much is okay to disclose. It's kind of like when we're in session with a patient, we have to decide, okay, am I going to disclose something you know, to you about myself? Is it going to help you in any way? Um, how will they perceive it? So, and could it be educational? So that's kind of the same process that I utilize when I'm deciding what to share. So I wanted to share, like, you know, my niece, super cute, you know, helps me with mental health, my own mental health, <laughs> a sense of connection. So these are things I feel comfortable sharing, and I think the general pe public might appreciate and realize I'm a person, not just someone who treats mental illness. Can I just add one um, on that same? vein. Uh, I think f as a journalist, disclosing my experience, um, I was just hoping that it would also be helpful for other people who are writers. You know, I, mm. when my friend died, it was a very isolating experience because I was at, I was at Yale, you know, it wasn't, we didn't talk about mental health, like you were on it 100% of the time. And it was such a painful experience to be isolated in my grief and try to process this, but also be very productive. Um, and I think as journalists, you know, we, we can be isolated, we do these difficult stories, and it's really, it, journalism is hard work, you know? Um, and I think being able to say, I'm experiencing this grief right now, even in the midst of my work, um, I just wanted to open up that, like, journalists can go to therapy too, you know? I think we all need to. Um, but yeah, I think just ending that stigma around sharing that it can be hard to do this thing called life. It's, it's always been fascinating <clears throat> to me coming from uh, rural Indiana where we don't talk about mental health to New York where like all the smartest, best people are all in mental health treatment. And, <laughs> and it's like, you know, I mean, when you go to Columbia, it's like assumed. Like, you know, if you're going to be a good psychiatrist, you, you go into treatment. I think it's in some ways one way that I want to perpetuate stigma, but like I call it supervision. And so, you know, it's less stigmatizing as opposed to like, no, I'm in there for treatment for like these really big issues. Um, Dr. Matu, you uh, are an active practice and, and, and you're posting videos in part inspired because of your patients. Whereas most people think about doing media as something they're kind of terrified their patients are going to see. Like um, the patient who came in yesterday and showed me that his girlfriend had found a picture of me with my two lactating goats with my arm around it. That was a awkward moment. But I don't think you post that kind of stuff online. And so I, I'm curious how it's been for you and especially how an academic institution uh, thinks about you in terms of content creation. If I do post a video about lactating goats, I think that would get a lot of hits. Um, <laughs> that'd be a great thumbnail. Um, well, I'm, I'm struck by a few things. One is the shared isolation. I think all of us work in a field where there, um, you know, I feel very isolated in my job. I might, uh, on a s slow day, I might see five patients. On a very busy day, I might see eight 
patients. Um, but it, it is very isolating. I have very limited contact with my colleagues and limited opportunities to check in and say, how are you going? Um, I was at a science writers conference a few, um, a few months ago, and that was the one thing everyone was talking about is isolation and burnout. So I definitely resonate with everything every, um, everyone is saying here. Um, I, I'm still terrified to post every single video. But when, what do you get worried about? What's gonna happen? <sighs> Is it, um, how are people going to see it? And the, the thing I get most concerned about are my colleagues. So this is kind of terrifying <laughs> right here. Um, because I really, um, it, their opinion really matters a lot to me. So same as the community of people who, who um, participate in my YouTube channel, but I, um, I really get concerned about my colleagues because I, I want to get it right. I want to get the content, the information right. I want to do it justice. And that's what I get most concerned about. Maybe it's all the years in grad school and all the criticism and the, the tough nature of that culture, but this is sort of in my head. Make sure you get the facts right. Make, make sure you get the story right. But that also doesn't quite work on YouTube. You can't just go in and do a factual video. That's not going to resonate with people. Um, you, you need to tell a human story. And the more I started doing this, the more I realized uh, I can't quite tell the story of my patients, but I can tell my story. And um, what I've what I try to do is bring a personal narrative that meets the best of mental health. Thank you, um, Sarah. Do you, we're getting into a second area that, and I want you to both tell us a little bit of your thoughts on self disclosure. But also, I'm really curious on how clickability and advanced metrics affects what you guys write in post. Because just uh, what Dr. Uh, Matu was saying, when I started writing about nutrition, like I thought omega-3 fats were so cool and you pitch fish stories and omega-3 fat stories and nobody else really thought they were cool. <laughs> That's not a good story. Telling a story of a patient, they don't say, do you have a patient we can interview? Do, do you have a patient story? Did you have these, these omega-3 fats, were there? did they affect your life? And, and so how do you think about that desire to get it right, which all four of you have, and then that desire to now we really know. It's not just it was on the front page. It actually got like a bazillion clicks. Actually, you probably know for your organization how much money they made in the ad space outside in the margins of your pieces. So two questions at once, but I'm sure you can handle it. Can I? You can. <laughs> <laughs> Is this working? Now it's working. Um, full disclosure, had I known that you were the reason I bought these god-awful kale chips for $8 at Whole Foods, I would not have been on this panel. See, I just hear this as a clinical opportunity for another kale consultation on how to make good kale chips. Regular, regular kale <laughs> is good. Oil, Homemade salt. kale chips are good. Right there. I bought this one bag, and I... It, oh. Exactly. You $8. can see the error in your ways I'm buying kale chips. It's like I'm a journalist. I can't afford $8 kale chips that are disgusting. <laughs> Let's be very clear on this. Um, two questions at once. Beginning on self-disclosure, I actually think of it as a reporting tool. There are things I tell my sources that I would never tell people mm. in this room on this panel. And I think as a reporter, I think Taylor really hit it on the head there's this impression that we're this elite group who is detached from everything we're writing about and then I put myself in my source's shoes and we're asking people in this in the kind of journalism that we do like please relive the worst moments of your life for me relive it again and again so I can ask you more intimate questions about it so I can fact check it because you know fat we like facts too and the hopes that something good might come out of you being re-traumatized. And to get someone to trust you, I think you need to trust them too. And I know that's not your traditional New York Times button-up reporter approach, but I think it's becoming one that's more accepted. And I just really see it, I see journalism as, in its essence, relationship building. And I think you can't do that without self-disclosure. So that's the first answer. Um, now we're going to talk about clickability, and that word makes my head explode. <laughs> and if you have a second, seven-second delay on this, that would be good. I'm going to try to not swear, but I cannot promise you anything. I think, depending on what news organization you're at, it's always something that some of your bosses are going to want to see. 
and uh, study stories are, and the smart stories and the stories that you hold back because maybe the guy who shot up the school actually, it's more about domestic violence than that he was just plain crazy. That's not sexy, to put it mildly, and um, that's kind of been the trend in many news organizations is we just need that one headline. And I think as journalists that takes educating people, educating our newsrooms, and just a, see I almost swore but I caught myself, a lot of self-advocacy and saying, hey, if you want to do this, you can, I won't, because this is inaccurate, this is sensational, this is not advancing any real narrative. And then let me tell you why what I want to do, the longer piece, the more sensitive piece, is the important one. And maybe I am uh, 26 years old and idealistic, but I still think that if it's really, really well written and factual, people are going to read it. And they're going to read it more than the one that is super clickbaity, and it's going to stay with them, and that's the one that's going to affect change. And that's, I think as reporters, we need to know how to sell editors who might not know it as much about it, and for me, that's always been the sell. Clickability? Um, so I've been lucky enough to work uh, for nonprofit news organizations where we didn't have to rely on ads and things like that, so um, how many readers or eyeballs were on a piece was a little bit above my pay grade <laughs> in, my, in my jobs, um, but I, I had a you brought up something and I totally lost it. Um, right, but so even like thinking of the stories that I'm able to convince my editors to let me tell, um, you know, being in criminal justice and, you know, the intersection of mental health, the question is always, why should people care? Why should we care about prisoners? Why should we care about whether prisoners have access to uh, quality mental health care? Um, and so really working to report out enough information or getting access to people um, in a way that I can say, you know, this one person to me is enough to write about. Like this, this kid is in prison because there's no beds in the state psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, like this person is incarcerated because he can't find care. Um, and so f for me, it, like, I, I feel like I, you know, there's a story that I wanted to do for a year when I was with the Marshall Project that just, you know, when I first pitched it, we, they didn't really see the news value, um, but then I was able to, you know, keep in touch with those sources, and it was one of my final pieces with them about, you know, this. There are patients in New Hampshire who are being transferred from a hospital to a prison simply because, like, the hospital didn't have room. Which is like, I was just like, this is, you know, these are. I feel like people will read this because it's. I don't, I don't even know how you can, you know, learn about this and not be. Um, feel some kind of emotion about it. Um, and then on the, to uh, speak to something Sarah said, um, for, you know, going back to my New Yorker piece, right, like, I made the mistake once of reading the comments um, <laughs> on the Facebook post. Never read the um, comments. <laughs> don't, it's a messy place. Um, but there was someone who disagreed with the way that um, some of the staff were, were portrayed in my story. Um, but, you know, I don't disclose that my friend passed away until the very end of the piece. And she knew that. Like, she, in her comments, she was like, you know, I'm sorry for what happened to your friend, but, like, these are bullet points of what I think was wrong with your story. And I, you know, what hit me from that was, like, she read the whole piece. Even if she disagreed with it, it was well written enough and, you know, contained enough narrative or whatever it is that keeps people reading that she finished it. And I think even, you know, it can be hard to talk about clickability, but just writing pieces that are compelling enough that people stay with you through the whole story and make it to the end is, you know, something that I really strive to do. It's interesting to hear the, the similarities in some ways between our fields, which often sometimes uh, it, well, it's just nice to hear. I mean, that you guys are isolated too, like us. <laughs> um, so um, I'm, I'm really curious for the clinicians, right? It's, uh, we are judged on the patient clinical hours we see or the academic papers we write, but you're here because you have following. Mm. And I'm wondering how that, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Matu uh, uh, posted a great video, is, uh, you know, is this bad CBT? 
And I like instantly clicked on it. And I was like, am I doing bad CBT? And I watched the whole video <laughs> just to make sure I, I wasn't. I, I probably am. But um, how does this influence the two of you? Um, it, it's um, a blessing and a curse. Um, and I can talk about the more cynical side and I can talk about the aspirational side. Let me lean into the aspiration first. Aspiration. So, and we'll bring the cynicism, um, we'll bring up the caboose. The, um, the thing that I've had to learn how to do is uh, when I'm creating content, think like a scientist, which that's what grad school taught me. Um, and then feel like an artist. That's the storytelling part. That's the human part. That's my story that I'm bringing in. What I've had to learn through YouTube is how to um, construct like an engineer. There's this great idea um, in engineering of failing fast and creating something, getting it out there, learning from the data, revising and rebuilding. And that's what YouTube has allowed me to do. I can see when people stop watching my video, um, which is terrifying, because you'll you'll spend all these hours putting something out there, and you're like, oh wow, most people stopped watching 20 seconds in. And um, what you have to do then is do what you just did, um, is you, you find the most interesting part of the story and you lead with that. Something that Derek Muller on the um, YouTube channel Veritasium calls lead with awesome. So this individual is, n there's no bed in a psychiatric unit, that's why he's here. Like that is the most interesting, um, part of that story so you lead with that because when someone's watching one of my videos YouTube they want you plugged into the ecosystem they're recommending other content on the side that does really well and you're competing with so many different things so if you don't pull someone in in the first five to ten seconds they're gone so I've had to fail fast learn from that figure out what thumbnails do well how do I write a title so you click on it like bad CBT six signs I think I forgot what it was called it was like six signs you're getting bad CBT or something like that uh, people love listicles um, so you have to find a way to grab someone's attention and then hold it so you can tell the story you want to tell um, I never learned any of that through grad school that was all through trial and error the more cynical side is um, it can change the mess it can change my message Message. So if I just follow the path of what gets the most clicks, um, I'm going to be doing a lot of listicles. I can take very emotional, polarizing views on current issues, and I'll get a lot of views, and I'll build my channel, but that's not the kind of content I want to make. So it's a constant tension between doing what is going to get views and staying true to my voice, the science, and the message that I want to get across. We've talked something about um, you know, journalists kind of getting some uh, nuanced knowledge about mental health. Many of you journalists in the room already have that. But um, what do you think is being done or should be done in terms of mental health clinicians who want to create content? Because it feels like some of those basics that you're learning and having to learn yourself are things that our colleagues in journalism and media, like the engineers, know a lot about. Y yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, but do you, do you want to try it? Uh, sure. First on that, but I'm just also curious how it affects you know the content you make. I feel like you influence a lot of um, younger. I see a lot of medical students always chiming in on your content, and I just think that's very inspiring to be kind of looking towards that generation. And part of I think fighting stigma is um, there's a, a new bring change to mind campaign around showing who mental health professionals are. Because people don't know who we are, we don't know what we do, people don't know the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist and a social worker, and part of bringing in the, the army that we need to treat the mental health epidemic is, is showing more of that. Right. Um, I've been fortunate. A majority of my followers are, yeah, medical students, people who want to be psychiatrists, but I have a lot of people who are also people who struggle with mental illness and are consumers of mental health treatment. My patients follow me as well. So um, when it comes to, you know, knowing what to post I I mean as much as I don't want to just post something because I think it's gonna get a bu bunch of likes my my Instagram names Freud and fashion so my way of like fashion when you think okay like fashionable it's my way of normalizing these discussions of mental health so I have to post a pretty picture as much as I don't want to it has to look nicely edited um, so people come to my feed because it looks nice but when they read the caption and the first line is like I'm um, I recently did a post that was about um, 
have you struggled with depression from moving away for college or you know grad school or for a career? Instantly, you know, people are gonna be like, that, that's me. So I've had to learn how to caption it, the first line, something that draws people in, something that I've struggled with, but something everybody else can relate with too. Um, so again, I mentioned being depressed, you know, having moved away for residency. Now when it comes to dealing with my patients, um, like I said, a lot of my patients follow me. I get a lot of requests all over the world from people saying, I can't access mental health treatment in like Saudi Arabia, like, can you help me? Um, you know, a huge, one word I have to say is boundaries. So as a clinician, we have to have boundaries. As much as I want to help people in, you know, in Asia who can't access a, a psychiatrist, I also have to have boundaries knowing, well, my purpose is to educate, but I can't help everybody. So um, I have to set those boundaries. And when it comes to my patients, because maybe they seen me like they said, oh, you recently went to Barcelona. You know, they might say, how was it? Um, and I'll say it was fun. Okay, now let's focus on you. You know, you have to have boundaries. Otherwise, um, people will try and seek you out for treatment support and we just, as clinicians, can't do that. So boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. It's sort of really getting quite redefined, right? The boundaries that you can see all kinds of aspects of my life. I have a couple of patients who follow me, and it's interesting. Uh, some, you know, sometimes it feels like you're really breaking the rules because they saw something, and other times it feels like it really strengthens an alliance. That there's that request we have of our patients of authenticity. That's really the only language of getting better is telling the real, raw, honest truth. And so there's some notion that um, patients always have that question about us. And that, that's a very therapeutic process to wonder about that feeling. But it's also for some patients who kind of don't work in that way, it's very reassuring for them in some ways and, and generates all kinds of other feelings. But it's, it's something that feels very unexplored. Uh, when I gave grand rounds at University of Kentucky, I asked about a year ago, I said, how many of the residents are on Instagram? And like all of them raised their hand. The chairman said, what's Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> And, and so something in terms of the next generation of psychiatrists is going to be significantly different because there is going, before you're a psychiatrist, or at least you can be as 30, you're going to have, what, 15 years of social media content on the cloud about you? Uh, so um, anyway, I, I, uh, we're running out of time. You, there's another innovation going on up here, which is none of you are uh, white men, except for, uh, and, um, and so you are... <laughs> I think that's uh, intent, uh, yeah, and uh, I think that's good in all kinds of ways. But I, um, and, and I mean that very sincerely that you also represent um, uh, cultures and groups that uh, do not traditionally have access to mental health care or talk about mental health care, ranging from the population of men, right? We all hear that great statistic that men get depressed half as often as women, but gosh, there's that other sticky statistics that they're four more times more likely to die by suicide. So I, I just, as we're finishing up, would just love some of your thoughts on, on, on diversity and mental health and mental health reporting and what's changing. Well, this is also tied to self-disclosure. Um, I, I think it's so important for me to model the type of change that I want um, my patients to to um, to do, or they want to do, and I'm trying to help them. Um, it also gets to the field and students coming up and other professionals. I, I want to show the type of behavior and professionalism and giving away um, psychological science to the public. Um, I, w I have to model that. Um, and the thing that I haven't realized, I, this is going to sound so corny, um, but I think the thing I didn't realize when I was getting into this is you also become a role model uh, for other folks out there. I was at a conference once and um, a young South Asian uh, graduate student came up to me and he said, I've never seen anyone who looks like me who is doing what you're doing. Um, and I've had teachers who say, I play your videos because I want people to, it, I want my undergrads to see that all psychologists are not white males because that's what they're getting in their textbooks. So um, that's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I've sort of fallen into that role without really realizing it and it brings a gravity and intentionality to what I post. Uh, so on Monday I posted this video about perfectionism and how I avoided making videos because I had this fear of failure. 
And the comments and the reactions to that have been so supportive and so healing. And a lot of folks have mentioned, you know, I've been dealing with this myself, and it's just so encouraging to see that you're dealing with this too. So, it, um, you have. I'm going to stop talking now because I don't have a good answer except um, it makes you very intentional about what you post. I think part of your answer is that professional isolation in some ways gets combated, that you, um, while you are alone, as we many of us are in clinical practice, there's this other community that you have that supports you. I mean, as you said, there were healing comments. And it's just, uh, I don't know, something new there it feels like. Taylor? Um, yeah, I think <laughs> journalism is struggling with diversity right now. I mean, I think we're moving slowly towards uh, reflecting the communities that we cover. Um, but I mean, I think it's something I, I think about a lot as, you know, I'm often one of very few people of color or black people um, in a newsroom. And so to also have this, like, you know, I talk about my mental health treatment pretty openly, um, but also to be the only, often the only black person in the room um, can be even more isolating. Um, but yeah, I also, I think about, you know, who, trying to be the person that I needed when I was growing up, like who I wanted to see write stories about me. Um, and so I, we know when I'm asked to do panels and things like this, I always say yes, because I want people to see, you know, there are black women investigative journalists, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones exists, right? But like, there are more of us out here, you know, and she's amazing, I love her. Um, and I, I, yeah, I also, when it comes to mental health treatment, um, I would, love to see more diversity um, on the other side of the couch, I guess. Because um, I think for me, that's also something that's interesting. You know, when I had a, a therapist who was a person of color, it was like, we could talk about things without me having to really break down structural racism, you know, um, which is like <laughs> just extra work on my part. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I think diversity uh, is, essential. I don't know that I would call it innovation because I think it's critical to the future of both our fields. I would agree with Taylor. Diversity is not innovation. Diversity is something that both of these fields have been lacking and really need to make up for. That's not innovative. It's just necessary. So my answer to this will be in an anecdote about my most recent project, which was um, sex abuse in a fundamental Baptist movement in which they shuffle the perpetrators around kind of like the Catholics do in short and so I'm a woman writing the story most of the victims are women and you can't talk about rape trauma without understanding mental health and trauma especially as you're working with these sources and they're like having flashbacks on the phone with you which was extremely isolating and I wish somebody at my paper had known a little more about mental health but this story was edited by three men, three white guys. And no, no hitting, not hitting all white male editors, had great ones, but there was this one point where one of them asked me, so, um, so this is cool, but uh, why don't you have any exclusive cases from like the last few months? It's like, okay, let me lady explain trauma and rape to you. And I think, having more voices, maybe had there been another woman in the room, like we wouldn't have had to have three conversations and have me write a three page memo about trauma and the process of trauma disclosure. It's important in shaping our stories, it's important in shaping our coverage, and I think it's, if you have, if you are someone who's not a white dude and you have really bad experiences as a young person, it'll just kick you out of the field. And I think that's the worst possible outcome. Can I add really quick? Of course. Um, OK, so it's well known in research that minorities don't seek mental health treatment, and also that especially women of color do not seek mental health treatment. I recently had to write a piece about my experience in therapy um, also being, you know, like, I'm Filipino. We don't seek treatment, <laughs> really. Um, I had to write a piece about that. And I looked up articles trying to find like what's been written about it. And I only found a few about um, you know, why um, minorities don't seek treatment and why they don't get help. And um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I would love to see more of that because I think it would break st stigma and encourage more people to want to potentially go and utilize the resources they have. Thank you. I think um, 
maybe the innovation we need is how do we get more diversity faster, sooner, <laughs> now, <laughs> both in both of our fields. Um, we have, uh, thank you both, uh, all, and uh, we have some questions, it seems like, and I think it's time to move to questions. So we talked about boundaries. First of all, this was a great panel, and thank you so much, all of you. Um, and I think we, we think a lot about boundaries with regard to the mental health practitioners, but also in, uh, for the journalists, um, while I agree entirely that, that little disclosure is a, is a very good thing, what does it do to upset the balance You know, when you are uh, working on a story and you kind of fall in love with the sources that you're, I don't mean romantically, but you know, you're, you're sharing, they're sharing with you, they're very tender or intense experiences, and you share a bit with them to be I I a part of the discussion. But at some point, you're not their friend and you're not their therapist, you're a journalist writing their story. So how do you deal with that? Uh, very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I, for me, uh, I mean, I can speak to boundaries. Um, having the New Yorker piece published so early in my career was very interesting. I, I was still in graduate school. Um, and I, it, it led to a lot of disclosures from my peers um, and people reaching out to me on social media, um, uh, which is overwhelming, to be honest, at first. You know, people were writing me like, about these horrible things that had happened to them and I was just like I'm not a licensed professional like thank you for sharing thank you for reading please like I hope you get a therapist <laughs> you know like I I can't I can't perform this function um but I also ran into the situation where people you know I'd written this this essay about something very personal and then it it led to people approaching me as if they they now knew everything about me and that we were very familiar and that they could you know ask me how my illness was doing and I was like these are not really conversations that I am interested in having uh, with you know my colleagues like that um, but with, when it comes to sources and 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 working with people to figure out how to tell their story in a compelling way um, you know I'm careful to say you know not I, at the end of the day, what I need to really get this story published is is the facts undergirding what you're telling me. And so, um, you know, I always have to remind myself to take a step back, despite how much I might identify with or really empathize with someone, um, someone's story, and to say, you know, do we have documents? Do we have things that I can take to my editors to say, you know, this is the truth, you know, we know this 100%, um, and just... You know, I, I think I'm, I'm strategic in what I disclose to sources. I don't say, you know, I'm Taylor, I live in Brooklyn on this street, and like, <laughs> these are all my life experiences that make us similar. Get me um, up. Right, like I, I, there are, I feel like I, I have, I have really thought about what I'm comfortable with sources knowing about me. Um, and so, I mean, it, it actually has never come up that, you know, my New Yorker piece when I'm talking to a source, it's like, mm -hmm. they don't, they, they haven't been like, well, you know, you're a crazy person, so how can you write this story? It, it has never, um, but I, anyway, I do share that, you know, I've had, I've lost people, I, you know, have experience with treatment, um, but I, it's a very, it is a, it's a hard line to walk, and I think it depends on your personal comfort level. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Sarah? I think, um, Obviously, part of the answer is if you are any sort of journalist, you can't just tell the story that you want to. Like Taylor said, you need documents, everything to back it up. So, But I think the harder part of that is so many of us get into doing these tough stories because we do care. And you have to tell yourself, and you might have to tell yourself over and over again, I can't fix it. I can't fix it for you. And maybe the people are asking you to fix something for them. Maybe they're indirectly asking. Maybe you just have this overwhelming feeling of obligation that this is like, my God, like, I wish I could make it better. A, uh, you can't. Whatever, if it is a problem so big that you are writing an investigation on it, you can't really do that single-handedly. B, that, again, that's crossing a line. And I think C, actually is that as a reporter, you, you need to check in on your own mental health and be really aware that if you are like, feeling guilt and feeling these obligations, like, that's an okay feeling. It's okay to acknowledge that feeling, but don't act on it. 
it strikes me as one of those things that there's really uh, an opportunity for rich cross fertilization in the sense of we think about this in mental health all the time when I get that compelling feeling that I want to help so much just like you I check that of course I'm gonna help that's my job but what is that thing what is that feeling that countertransference as we call it pulling me in and how does that affect my sense of boundaries and what I'm gonna do um, next question um, mine is a very similar question. I just want to dig in on this a little more. I'm a documentary filmmaker here, and as a filmmaker, doing a story on mental health, that requires even deeper relationships to get trust and access. And when you're working with somebody over the course of nine months to get that story, it's really hard to set boundaries, and then sources really do kind of start to see you as a therapist because you're around all the time. Mm -hmm. And that is not my role, I'm a journalist. So I am wondering how you have those conversations with your actual sources who are giving you all this access, who you're building a tremendous amount of trust with because you're literally filming their life. Um, how do you navigate that? How do you navigate those hard conversations? Um, I just have a quick story that might relate to that. Um, so I, the pieces that I do tend to take a little, not um, nine months, although what I'm doing now is gonna take a year. But um, you know, I had the experience of this. Uh, I was writing about uh, dental care in prisons and there was this woman who had lost her husband. Um, he was in prison for six years near the end of his life and um, she experiences very painful loss and you know she was amazing an amazing source she was giving me all these documents she was giving me his medical records and talking to me constantly and then you know the days leading up to the piece being published uh, my editor decided to cut her out of the story mm -hmm. um, and so to, to have that phone call with her afterwards where she you know she I answered my phone and she goes Taylor what happened you know what like she had shared all of this um her life with me you know really and so i i it was probably the most uncomfortable phone call of my life um for me what i try to prioritize when i'm interacting with my sources um is that i'm here to listen and acknowledge what you're experiencing um and i have to limit myself to that i can't you know like sarah said i can't fix it as much as i would like to you know end all human suffering um my role as a journalist is to say you know i see you i'm listening to what you're saying and it, this is painful um, and hopefully you know at the end of the day we're going to be able to put out a story that shares your experience you know in hopes that it will change things in the future um but also being honest you know like i i had to explain to this woman you know my editor decided to go in a different direction but like i still still try to make her feel valued and really let her know that i appreciated her opening her life to me for I mean we'd been talking for months before the story and then for this to um, for that to happen it was really it was really frustrating for me as well but um, just kind of taking trying to just repeat to myself that like I'm I'm a listener you know like I'm I can't I can't let myself get more emotionally invested than that it's it's really hard I mean I I can't imagine um, having to film someone instead of just like talking to them but so I am queen of the nine month projects. I feel you <laughs> to like the point that it's a joke amongst my friends. Um, and I did one of my the piece that was on the screen about uh, that kid in Mississippi ended up being a documentary. So um, all the kudos to you for getting people to agree to go on film. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, my way to handle it, I just I'm very upfront in the beginning. Like, I'm a journalist. This is what I'm going to want from you. And the process goes like this. Like we're gonna have a first interview, I'm gonna talk again, I'm probably gonna have a bunch of questions that I forgot to ask upon rereading the transcript. We're gonna fact check, I can't promise it's gonna go in, here's what I'm gonna need from you to make this work. I just, I'm very, and I think journalism for a lot of people that are not journalists is a very opaque process when actually it's like, I think it's extremely straightforward and easy to explain to people. And I think if you explain it in the beginning, like this is the process, here's how it goes, here's some ways it might go. Bring them along with you in that professional sense, I think that makes it a lot easier. Something I'm thinking about as I'm listening to our conversation is there, there could be a great opportunity for us to, for our fields to collaborate in some type of psychological first aid training. Um, what do you do when you are working with someone um, on a phone call, a, a source that you only talk Somebody to? Somebody was on the phone with me having like a flashback and yeah. hyperventilating, and I was like, I am not prepared for this. I don't know what the heck to do right now. And I wish there were, I, like, I wish I'd gotten training. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, there are, for those of you who are interested in learning more about that, there's a number of organizations that do psychological first aid training. Um, but I think this is something, we, sh we should do something about this, um, because you all are dealing with a lot. You're on the front lines of a lot of stuff. It also feels like some of those basics that we do in that initial stages of treatment, right? We set boundaries, we set expectations, right? We talk about some of the process that's clear and the process that's not, and then also your experience that as you make more documentaries, you'll see this arc. So next time you see it, I, I think it's very clear to, it, it helps people. I tell patients when they like me, it's like, that's good, that's good for right now. What's really important to me is when you don't like me because that's really when some really good work often gets done. Um, I want to take a few more questions if we can. Sure, hi, um, my name is Ashley. I'm a social science researcher at Yale in psychiatry. I'm also a person who's written about my experience with mental illness and being in hospitals. Um, and yeah, just interested in learning more about the journalism side of these things. Um, so as a person who's a scientist, and works in mental health and has written publicly about her experiences. Um, I have I have a question really for Taylor, but I'd like to hear from all of you. But like, so there's something about self-disclosure when you have control of the narrative, when you're the person writing it, when you get to put on the nuance, like when you know that these things were like the critical things, and so you need to make sure those get across. And then there's the other side where you're being interviewed and um, those things might not be important. They might not be in there at all. You might say something that gets, that all of a sudden is the flashy sentence. Um, and that becomes the story rather than, um, which doesn't mean it's not true. It's just not authentic to um, the like lived experience of the narrative. And so I was kind of wondering, how do you balance that when you're interviewing people um, and it was glad to know that like you're really upfront, um, you know, kind of about this is how it's going to go. These are the rules. Those are the things. I think they're helpful. Um, but as a person who, um, you know, I want to share my story, and I have what is right now a flashy, sexy mental health story, which never happens. But I'm getting, you know, a really innovative treatment um, for treatment-resistant depression, and have been approached a lot, and have really said no because I'm so concerned about. Now it's this sexy, flashy story, and I might say this was like a miracle, and then now I'm promoting cowboy medicine that's happening. I mean, there are all these like factors, and so I'm just curious, like how do you hold that all, and then also know that like you don't have that ultimate power. Um, yes. Taylor, I'm going to ask you because we have, I think, okay. five minutes, and I want to do five minutes, five questions in five minutes, right. and so because right. I think everybody wants to answer questions, so if we can just. I want to hear the answer, but a short one. Yes. Um, I think you have to really, it's a leap of faith. Um, when I am interviewing people who don't normally do media interviews, I'm very upfront with them about, you know, the potential impact of them, their story being published. Um, I also try to be pretty generous with people who don't normally do interviews. If they say something kind of off the wall, I kind of, I, you know, check in, like, we, <laughs> we're on the record. Are you, is that, you know, what you meant to say? Um, but I mean, I, I, we can talk more offline about it. Um, but it is like, it is scary. You have to trust, really trust the journalists to be able to get um, your story right. And I think that is also the power of first person narrative to be able to get, you know, you know, you're getting the story right. I think it's also a huge barrier as we see in terms of promoting stigma that we have a very hard time sharing authentic patient stories with journalists. Uh, that it's it's um, uh, that uh, it's tr a tremendously complicated subject, but it's a really great question. Next question. Hi, um, I'm Rachel. I'm a bioethics student here. And um, this spring, I'm applying to medical school, so I've been thinking a lot about my personal statement. <laughs> um, and a pretty common uh, format is for a student to talk about you know, a very meaningful interaction they had with the healthcare system and how you know, that made them want to become a doctor. And as interested and, and as I am like, in mental health and as liberal as I consider myself, I still can't help but think that if that interaction is you know, psychiatric, that it would be easier for it to go you know, horribly wrong. And um, as some of the clinicians here have dis um, disclosed their own struggles, you're also all very accomplished. 
and you know was waiting until that point a conscious decision mm-hmm. and if you were still a trainee um would you feel differently than you do now that's an excellent question and i get that all the time actually from students um mm-hmm. i've read several personal statements and um i know one i i edited and wrote a letter of recommendation for and he talked about his experience being um, having bipolar disorder and how being hospitalized and being in treatment actually empowered him to want to be a physician and change the system after experiencing things. So I feel like if you phrase it in a way that, because we want to know about you, right? When you're applying to medical school, we want to know what's influenced you. And I think that it's the stigma about it being perceived negatively is going away. It is a risk. But if, it's, if you're able to phrase it in a way like, this is me, I'm open about it, and this is gonna help me become a better physician, I think it be, can be very successful. Now, would I have done it then? I mean, I was ages ago <laughs> when nobody really talked about, uh, no physicians really talked about it, I probably wouldn't have. Um, but now that more people are open, it's more in the media about physicians dying from suicide more than any other profession, I think now is, a uh, an appropriate, a way more appropriate time. Um, A quick thing I wanna encourage everyone in this room to remember is we we tell stories about our scars, not our wounds. And that's something I encourage a lot of people to think about is when you're ready to tell a story, when you have context, when you have perspective, then tell your story. If you're in the middle of a crisis, if you're still struggling with the thing you wanna tell a story about, maybe it's better time to wait a little bit. I, I told a story, or I wrote a piece about um, the experience I had losing my brother to suicide. And I wrote that when I was a postdoctoral fellow. How intentional was that? It wasn't intentional in terms of I'm waiting until I'm almost done with training, but it was about five years after I lost my brother, which is on average how long it takes people who had a suicide-related loss to talk about it. Um, If I was a trainee now, the world is very different. Um, NPR had a great series about um, a doctor who disclosed their, um, uh, or a medical student who disclosed their depression in medical school. So I would look that one up to help you to get a little context on here. I think the world has completely changed in terms of how we're talking about mental health, and I would probably be more open to talking about those kind of things if I was a trainee now. Next question. Thank you, that's a great question. Hi, um, my name's Pooja. I'm a psychiatrist um, from George Washington University, and I specialize in women's mental health. This has been an amazing uh, panel, so thank you guys all for being part of it and um, it really is powerful how similar our fields are um, so that really stands out to me but I'll be quick the one question I had for the clinicians is how do you guys deal with um, stigma uh, in our own profession to social media and sort of being like out on social media Um, because I definitely face that a lot and and to be honest I didn't tell anybody at my department that I was coming here for this conference Media. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I so I mean I think it that really that fear and I know you talked a little bit about it, but that fear is like it's real yeah um I'm I understand where you're coming from I'm fortunate I'm in private practice I feel like I could do what I want a little <laughs> for the most part but I do get that question from a lot of people in academics and um my <laughs> this hard. My suggestion all the time is if you feel like your department is supportive, because you can kind of get an idea of the culture right away if it's this going to be negative and be detrimental to your career. I always say you have to gauge if you think that there's an openness around it. Um, and honestly, that's the one thing I always say because it could be different ev- wherever you go. Yeah, um, so a couple of things. One is find your allies. Um, I do work in a medical center, so um, it, it's, it's academia. Um, and y- there are allies throughout your department who are supportive of this kind of thing. I, I've been fortunate. I haven't had too many times where I've had a superior come up to me and say, this whole social media thing you're doing, it's bad. Um, I think that ship has sailed a long time ago. The debate on whether or not doctors should be online is 
is is over. Um, so find your allies. The other thing is also what's the value of it. And um, for me here at Columbia, there's two things that are very clear that my department's been very supportive of. Everything we're doing here, it's it speaks to the um, education arm of the university and the medical center. And so that value is consistent. And then there's also the recruitment <laughs> aspect of it. Um, I get a lot of people calling in who want to come in for appointments because they've seen my work. So it does fulfill that more financial arm too. Um, so find those shared values. Thank you. Um, I always think back to Dr. Deb Cabanis, who taught me about narcissism as a resident and reminded me that there's some healthy narcissism because I think part of the um, meaning of um, really being true to yourself and doing something you believe in and then goodness will follow. Um, and, and that I think it takes a lot. You can hear the insecurity we all have of trying to make good content. Uh, but I think the hardest part for me was confronting the part of it that felt good because it was attention and the part of it that then felt good because you were successful about it. But the part that feels really good which is some random person emails you and says like, you know, I changed how I ate and I, I got pregnant, just wanted you to know that. Or I, you know, I haven't done anything about my meds, but I'm, I'm eating this way and I think it helps and thank you. Yeah. That, that, that really, as a clinician, gets exciting because it's the idea that, I, suppose, I love treating the individual, but in those moments where you want to sort of help with some knowledge you have or some insight you have, or just a little phrase like, we tell stories about our scars, not our wounds, just gets you thinking about your mental health. Uh, I think those moments and sharing those moments with your superiors and sharing with your vision and ideas, I think that paves the way to do, uh, to get involved. I mean, what medical center doesn't want to be involved in social media right now? They're still yeah. scared of it. <laughs> Thank ne you. Next yeah. question. Hi, uh, my name is Samantha. I'm in the journalism school. I have a question about self-disclosure and how we can better do that within our own newsrooms. So I'm thinking, um, I'm in graduate school right now, and some of the issues that I've had with like personal mental health issues sometimes are really well received in the journalism community, and other times I've had really tough experiences with people who aren't as understanding. And it really makes me think about if people in newsrooms are like that, we're one, not supporting our journalists, but then two, we're not able to best tell people's stories. And I'm wondering if you had any thoughts or tips on how in newsrooms we can do a better job. I think um, in disclosing in your newsroom, I think it's important, like I, no matter the stigma of it, because you need to take care of, like we've all been saying, this is a tough field and you really, really need to prioritize self-care and so many of us don't do that. And I think it's the small things like to have like a brown bag at your newsroom about like bring in there's a bunch of smart people in this room who I'm sure would come into whatever newsroom that you're at and have a mental health brown bag learn how it affects us as reporters learn how to report it better and I think I don't think there's a magic bullet I think it's just ongoing conversation but um yeah find your allies and self-care has to has to has to come first um yeah ditto I think uh like Sarah said, find your allies in the newsroom. Um, and I will be honest, not a lot of people who are at the top of newsrooms are, you know, people from the old guard, you know, people who are not interested in whether you're seeing your therapist this week or not. Um, so I think you, you have to pick your battles um, and you have to really understand what you need to be able to be productive and also healthy um, and do whatever that is. I'm getting more ideas for collaboration here. Uh, <laughs> so there's going to be a 2.0 to this. Yes. And I think that 2.0, maybe we need to do workshops in newsrooms about vicarious trauma. It's something our field shares in common a lot. Hearing painful stories all day long, we very much share that in common. So what can we do to help each other with that? I think that's something we should yeah, figure out absolutely. too. I think that's another uh, place to plug diversity. Um, so being in the criminal justice field, seeing videos of police shootings and things like that um, impact me in a different way than my white colleagues. And it has been very difficult to, you know, be in a newsroom where that's primarily a majority white newsroom and have to explain like, you know, this is a hard day for me because of this, but you know, there are other people who are, you know, my bosses and things like that who don't have the same frame of reference. Um, so just being, you know, I'll, I'm being honest, you know, it's not going to be, you can self-disclose, but it might not be, people might not have, you know, the smart might not be there, um, but. I think yeah. it's also a question of what's the upside of self-disclosure in the workplace? Because I know when my mental health is at my worst, the last thing I want to do is tell my colleagues. 
because I'm already worried that they're, you know, I'm like barely keeping up. And, uh, and so I think part of it is trying to understand what the upside is. There certainly is, and I think the finding, um, I, I call Dr. Sutterer whenever I have problems and he puts me in a good spot and, and checking with a colleague, but also institutionally, how you know, finding that line between self-disclosure, which is, I think, an advanced step, and just getting the conversation going. Hey, let's talk about mental health. Hey, we've been reporting really, really hard stuff. How's it affecting you? What are those basic mental health first aid and mental health toolbox things that we all know about, right? Take a deep breath get good sleep hygiene but when organizations remind us of that and encourage that i think that we then we're doing mental health work even if we're maybe not fully self-disclosing yet dr varma hi i have a question for you guys first of all i want to say thank you for for all of you for doing this this feels very historical and, and monumental um i'm a psychiatrist i've been in practice for 12 years now and speaking to the um, media for the same amount of time for all the major news outlets and i contribute on a weekly basis to nbc abc um, the last time I remember being at something like this was 2006. Uh, the AMA used to have a medical communications conference, um, and I'm not aware that they're doing that anymore, so this feels amazing. Um, I want to ask you guys, you're really making me think about a lot of things, and this sort of, for me, a dual identity of somebody who contributes to the media and speaks about these things, but also as a psychiatrist. And what you said, Dr. Matu, really resonated with me when Dr. Drew asked you, what, what, what are you most afraid of? And I think one of my fears has always been about how my colleagues, who I have utmost respect for, and my profession will perceive what I'm saying, and the credibility, integrity, and authenticity, first and foremost, and the scientific aspect of what we're saying. At the same time, I realize this evidence-based jargon doesn't always speak to sort of mainstream media. And a lot of times I've had to say no and be very picky about the topics that I sign up to talk about. but there is an aspect of there's something accessible about this sensational news, right? So how do we walk that line? Like for me, in my mind, I've always said like the first thing is the credibility. At the same time, delivering this information to people in a way that will catch their attention. I'm not talking about being on Jerry Springer, right? But I'm talking about how do you make it in a way so that there's a catchy headline? So there is something sexy and sensational about it, but then there's a real story behind it, right? And a lot of times when I've pitched things to the media, they're like, nah, that's too boring. That's too scientific, we don't want to hear about that. We want like the dirt, the juice, the gossip. It's not always the case. I think it's very dependent on which the outlet is, and some of them have been extremely respectful, um, and there's been um, you know, understanding of the profession and our limitations and our boundaries, and I've always said, like, I'm just here to provide education. I'm not here to treat anybody you know, on stage or whatever it is. I'm not gonna continue treatment. I'll give resources. But it's been a very interesting and fascinating and difficult journey sort of, um, sort of navigating and negotiating both roles. So I'm just curious what you guys think about that and what your experience has been it's uh, it's a lot of i just realized right now it says do not lean into mike and i've been leaning into the mic so i'm sorry uh, <laughs> i feel like such a toxic masculine <laughs> stuff is happening right there but um that's my self-disclosure. Um, it's it's a lot of hard work to do exactly what you're saying. And um, I'll say this to our, our journalist colleagues, when we get calls from you and you're asking us these questions, it's really hard because we want to default to our jargon because that's the way we're thinking. But to say something that's valuable to you in a way that I know will move on in your story and, and be a valuable con contribution, it's really hard. I like to tell people that one of the most difficult things in my career was speaking on a live episode of MTV's Teen Mom. It was so <laughs> challenging. I'm gonna YouTube that uh, right after it, this panel. It's behind a paywall, um, but you can find it. Uh, I'll send you the link. Um, and what was challenging to that is the audience of that show they're largely teenagers and individuals in their early 20s. And I, was, I knew I was going to have seconds in between larger dynamics that were playing out. So how do you say something of, valuable, uh, something of valuable or something of value in that short time that is also consistent with science? It's, it's a challenge. And so what I, I do a lot of prep for any interview that I'm doing. I try to develop um, three talking points that are backed by science but also have an emotional human connection. That's a lot of work. That's really difficult. And a, a lot of times my colleagues don't know that. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll say, oh, that was great. I really like what you did. But they don't know the hours of prep and thought that went in to those 10 seconds yep. that they mm -hmm. saw. Mm -hmm. 
the um, uh, first book I worked on was with the magazine editor, and he said, um, you know, you got to understand, you're going to publish it, and half of people are going to hate it, and half of people are going to love it, and that means you're doing a good job because you're getting a reaction. I think it's it's just um, a challenge to keep pitching and keep crafting, and then you end up in strange situations. I got a call the morning that Anthony Bourdain was found. I got woken up, and uh, like five minutes later, I was the voice on the Today Show talking about the suicide epidemic. I am not the suicide expert in our department. I treat a lot of patients with suicidal thoughts, but I'm not the go-to expert for that. That then kind of you know did what news does, and suddenly that afternoon, I had a three-minute NPR spot. And I think in those moments, I think about my colleagues supporting me and saying, man, do, do the best you can. There's an opportunity, it's lunchtime on Friday, everybody's wondering, what do you do if you feel this way, if you have a family member? And that felt like all those other moments where I didn't know, am I being sensationalistic talking about kale, or am I this or that, kind of led to this piece where like, I know that piece I did that day at noon, I knew it reached people who had those questions, and I did my best to represent my colleagues and represent the evidence, but also just be a person. Um, but I think that's the question that we struggle with in mental health, and especially if you're a clinician, right? How much of this is, uh, um, how can we really connect in the way that Dr. Matu said and, and tell that human story and still maintain credibility within our field? I think that's rapidly changing, but yeah, it's always a question. It looks like our minder is here. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry not to get. I hate to stop this panel. Actually, I would listen to this panel all day. Uh, but people have to go to the bathroom. Um, so uh, thank you, first of all, to this panel, which was amazing. <laughs>